morning to all of you. Welcome to the webinar series organized by Department of. Hello. Nishant, I cannot see you. Uh, yeah, Shubhadeep, uh, there is a, the camera is actually not attached to this uh, system because the other system where the camera is attached, there is some problem with that. It's with okay, the laptop. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, so you can just hear me, but you can hear me clearly. Yes, I can hear you clearly. But one thing, could we check the share screen once before we start? Because last time it didn't work. One second, Shubhadeep. Share screen start. Karte hai, kaise? Uh, Shubhadeep, you have to do it from your side. So I am actually now I am in the screen sharing mode, but can you see what I am sharing? Yes, yes. Um, a YouTube video you are sharing, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. So, a very good evening to all of you. Welcome to the webinar series organized by Department of Germanic Studies, English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. At the outset, let me take this opportunity to thank our chief patron, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor E. Suresh Kumar, for his support in organizing this international webinar. Also, I would like to thank the administration technical staff for the support despite heavy rains, flooding, and electricity failure. Today's talk is titled, No Animals Were Harmed in the Making of This Film, The Cinematic Life of Dead Animals by Dr. Shuvadeep Sinha. Dr. Sinha is Assistant Professor at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the College of Liberal Arts, University of Minnesota. Dr. Sinha has completed his PhD from Western University, Canada, and his research areas are Indian cinema, modern South Asian literature and culture, global modernities, and philosophy of non-human. So thank you, Dr. Sinha, for agreeing to be a part of our webinar and share your ideas with us. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Sinha to deliver his talk. Over to you, Dr. Sinha. Uh, hi, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear okay. you. Okay, let me first uh, thank you. Thank you, the organizers and the vice chancellor and everybody in the administration who are part of uh, this webinar, particularly the news coming from Hyderabad and flooding and all the things that have been happening over the last couple of days. So, and also um, thank you particularly to Anu, Dr. Pandey for inviting me. I'm kind of an odd person out or odd animal out in this webinar. Uh, the previous two speakers, <coughs> I saw that they are from German studies, Germanic studies, I'm not. so. I'll try to fit myself in within this series and let me, um, so if, if something goes wrong with sharing screen or, or just uh, let me know, I, uh, I can go over stuff uh, <clears throat> again. So as uh, it's okay if I, if I refer to you as Nishant, right? So as, as it was pointed out, the, the title of my talk is No Animals Were Harmed During the Making of This Film, Cinematic Life of uh, Dead Animals. And um, so a couple of things, a couple of ideas that I would like to reflect upon in today's uh, presentation. The ideas are, of course, death and animals and how we look at and remember uh, non-human animals death in, in cinema. So the first part of the title within quotes, no animals were harmed during the making of this film. I'm sure most of us or all of us are familiar with this disclaimer that appears 
during either opening or closing credits uh, for uh, films or TV shows that particularly shows that show cruelty against animals or death of animals. And it has become kind of a universal phenomenon to give this uh, disclaimer. Uh, add this disclaimer, even in Indian cinema's context. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, when I first started thinking about this topic, I uh, this is like this, this disclaimer is so obvious and so common that we don't often notice that even if we are watching films that show brutal cruelty against non-human animals. But what what is there? Like what lies behind? What is the history behind this disclaimer? That is one point. And also uh, another question that comes to my mind that whether this disclaimer makes any impact on our reception or understanding of this visual representation of this cruelty and deaths on screen. So let me give you some history, like how this, this history behind this disclaimer, what happened so as soon as and this information is easily available in you know, uh, in a lot of resources so as soon as the movie industry began to take off particularly in hollywood in early 1900s 1920s and 30s the american human association sought oversight over how the industry treated animals in its films and as time went by they grew more and more insistent especially as Westerns and war films became more and more popular, since both these types of films tended to treat horses particularly as if they were taking part in actual battles. And one of the more main concern uh, for American Human Association was the use of uh, tripwares uh, in, in, <clears throat> in these films like particularly this chase during this ch shooting of chase scenes, fighting scenes, horse, it, they were used to wear trip wares to make the horses trip and, and create this dramatic, of course, uh, impact. And so these trip wares are used to tangle horses and show them dropping as if shot by guns or arrows. And these particular sequences were particular were, were protested against by the human society. However, while there were films uh, where over a dozen dozen horses were killed via this technique, the filming of 1939 film called The Charge of the Light Brigade saw over two dozen horses killed. And still there was protest, there were protests, there were insistence, but nothing concrete happened, like no over oversight was given, no jurisdiction was given to the to animal rights activists or American Human Society. Uh, so the movement came to gain further momentum and brought uh, AHA, that is the Human Association, oversight into effect in the aftermath of public outcry against the way horses were treated in the film, in a 1939 film called Jesse James, starring Tyrone Power and Henry Fonda. So in this particular film, there was a dramatic scene towards the end of the film where two male protagonists, two, uh, Frank and Jesse James, are being chased by a posse. And their only way out is to jump from a cliff into a lake with their horses. So as you can, uh, uh, so the, this, this particular sequence was shot uh, on location and uh, the two male actors were replaced by one body double who was apparently paid very high fees for doing the stunt. But as you can imagine, the horse did not enjoy such, such a privilege. The horse was a horse. There was horse did not have a body, body double. So let me just show this clip uh, uh, from that film uh, to see, to let you know what kind of brought, started this, uh, the history of this disclaimer. Uh, let me, I'll play a short clip from the film, the actual horse scene.
Jesse. Jesse. So as you can see that uh, this is two two male characters they are the cliff uh, uh, with their horse and in, in fact one single shot uh, uh, they were and it was shown from it was recorded from two different angles to give a sense that two men were jumping uh, the thing is even after the death of two dozen horses in previous films that did not do much in terms of ensuring the animals rights but this where one, only one single horse was killed in this in this uh, in this particular clip during the shooting of this clip this started the whole process <clears throat> and there was a lot of debate the filmmakers actually people involved with the production they were saying the horse was uh, treated in a very human way it did not die uh, from the fall and then people activists they said okay they did uh, the horse did not die from the fall but it was died because of the sh it died because of the shock not from an actual actual injury and eventually this particular sequence gave uh, uh, permission to aha representatives of aha to be uh, vigilant uh, maintain their vigilant presence on sets during shooting of of films and ensure safety and security of what they call animal animal actors and i for for this talk and also for thinking about the larger project i went to their website and started gathering informations about how they approach this particular project and they say very clearly that we remain extremely vigilant to make sure that no animal and they mention this from an ant to an ze to a zebra they are, none of them are treated in an in an inhuman way uh, during the shooting of the film uh, but of course um, Uh, the activism and the project of raising public awareness about cruelty against animals in film industry uh, till that continues in spite of AHS AHS vigilant presence from time to time animal rights activists speak up about flaws within their policies and like uh, certain loopholes within their functioning the way they uh, this association function for example how say for a particular film crew uh, the crew members fail to ensure humane treatment of animals during shooting of specific films one recent example like there are several but one example may be familiar to a lot of us here is the shooting of ang lee's life of pi uh, so if you have seen the film you must remember the tiger royal bengal tiger that is uh, that appears as an animal companion for a large part of the film and most of this uh, most of this film was shot uh, or made during using cgi that is computer generated imagery but for certain sequences cgi uh, was not good enough and for that they need to they used an actual tiger called king and some of the people who were who paid attention to the production history of the film they argued that the actual tiger uh, king was treated rather shabbily and did uh, during the shooting of the film and they did not follow all the directives of aha and think like that this is just one example several such examples exist like um, you, you you can look at blog entries little news pieces from time to time where they single out films like that okay they they like saying that they did not do it uh, uh, safeguard the animal actors properly and another area of concern is how these animal actors are treated in between periods of actual shooting uh, so on and so forth so aha is jurisdiction uh, goal um, uh, exists during the period of shooting like they can be on location they are on sets to ensure safety and security but how these animal actors are treated between these periods where they are kept or how their day to day life is taken care of those things are beyond the jurisdiction of aha and lot of animal rights activists 
particularly related to the film industry they say that the the jurisdiction is needs to be expanded and uh, there should be a more uh, comprehensive uh, overview over over uh, like comprehensive control over the well-being uh, of of these these animals uh, so as you can imagine as you can see that all this activism and protests and reporting are concerned may of course about the concerns are about real animals animals that are living that have life that are living beings and that exist beyond the screen so and this this actually brings me to a question that all these people and i i, I totally understand completely understand the the necessity of this activism about uh, ensuring safety and security of living animals but also it brings up a curious question about what happens how do we receive the cruelty to that is done to the image that is done to the image even if it is cgi even if it it is not an actual animal that is the animal that appears on screen uh, so uh, let me and that make me go to the website of of the AHA, the organization, and they have among several pages on their website, they have a kind of quest FAQ page, where two questions uh, kind of made me very interested and 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 drew my attention to this. So uh, let me read these questions. I'll share the. Uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint too, or let me share the PowerPoint and while I read just a second. So this is one question, uh, and I don't know if it is it, the question is asked by an actual person or they it's they're like they're they're kind of presumptive. So one question is, I have seen American humans seal of approval on movies with scenes that seem to convey an attitude that cruelty to animals is okay. How can a human organization condone a message of animal cruelty? And um, to this presumed question, the association answers, the purpose of Amer American humans film and TV monitoring uh, TV monitoring is to safeguard animals on set, regardless of whether the scene being portrayed conveys an animal friendly message. The objective of our monitoring work is the welfare of the live animals used in film production. And to that end, we refrain from commenting on content. If we refuse to monitor, if we refuse to monitor a film because we did not agree with its message, we would risk their being no protection at all for the animals involved. Another question that appears, I have seen movies that contain extremely violent scenes with animals, such as battles where horses are falling or dog fights, but then at the end, there is American humans, no animals were harmed statement. How is that possible? And at that, the association answers that filming techniques, controlled stunts, special effects, and post-production editing can make complicated battle scenes appear realistic without injuring animals or human performers. The movie The Last Samurai, for example, enacted extensive battle scenes involving more than 60 horses. Shubhati, without in uh, Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. There is one participant who is unable to hear you. Okay, but can you just that... raise the volume from your side? Uh, just a second. But I uh, am I audible now? Yes, uh, but the thing is, uh, there are some participants who are logged in and they are unable to hear you clearly. They are repeatedly requesting us to tell the uh, tell you to you know raise your volume a little bit just a second um
Hello, Shivadeep. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can uh, yeah. I have I have increased the volume of my like output, so I should be much louder now. Okay, okay, good. Okay, you can continue now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, Nishant, can you hear me? Yes, Shivadeep, you can continue now. Uh, the thing is, I, I lost share screen option. I don't know how. I lost uh... the share screen option. One second, Shivadeep, yeah. It is activated from our side. Okay, just a second. Yes, uh, I'm back. Uh, yeah okay great okay. Uh, so let me repeat the second question once more uh, so i have seen movies that contain extremely violent scenes with animals such as battles where horses are falling or dog fights but then at the end there are there is american humans no animals were harmed statement how is that possible and the answer is filming techniques, controlled stunts, special effects, and post-production editing can make complicated battle scenes appear realistic without injuring animals or human performers. The movie, The Last Samurai, for example, enacted extensive battle scenes involving um, more than 60 horses without injuring a single one. Animals used in filmed entertainment are well-trained to perform specific stunts, such as falling down on cue, and the rest of the illusion is created by the filmmakers. Despite the realism of modern films, almost every scene in today's movies is a portrayal of an event, not a filming of the actual event. Under our guidelines, for example, filmmakers would not be allowed to hold an actual dog fight. Uh, so the this, these are very uh, I I find these answers question uh, answers to these questions to be very ironical because uh, again another question is there like where where AHA representatives are saying we have no jurisdiction over the plot etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you look at the, these these questions and answers you will see that even a very vigilant animal rights activist is making a curious distinction between uh, real material animal and the cinematic animal, as if uh, violence against the real living animal needs to be stopped, needs to be protested against. But as far as it is, it is a non-living image. It's it's fine. Uh, it's fine and. It's just product of product of trick, and that is that is the that is the conan that is the conundrum I, I I I keep thinking about that how do we even if the animals are not real animals without it's not a biological being, but how do we still as human spectators respond to their uh, violence against them or their deaths on screen or how do we remember them? even if after they disappear from our vision. Uh, because you can imagine that this is also uh, some of the points I, I, when I was listening to the first talk of this series, uh, I, have, I couldn't listen to the second one yet. And there was this, th there, is a, there is an anthropocentric approach, uh, uh, approach towards watching and remembering deaths on cinema. We tend to remember uh, 
empathize, sometimes sympathize, get disturbed more uh, with with human with the death uh, death of human animals. But when it comes to non-human animals, we sometimes forget. We sometimes ignore or don't get disturbed as much. Not all of us, but a number of us. And my point is paying attention to not only the death or cruelty, death of or cruelty against real animals, but also a way of thinking and remembering the death of the animal as the image needs to be incorporated, needs to be accommodated in order to think of a non-anthropocentric approach to death, death and violence on screen. Uh, I'll give one little quote, which I always find interesting. And this quote comes from, and it, it has nothing to do with animals. Uh, there is this film called Ghost Dance, where it's kind of a quasi documentary experimental film where uh, philosopher Jacques Derrida appears in an interview. And there is a, and he has said similar things in other writings too. But in that interview, when Derrida was asked that, do you believe in ghosts and, and cinema and et cetera. And he says in that interview, cinema is the art of allowing ghosts to come back. And of course, uh, Derrida is hinting at how cinema as a medium is essentially ontological in destabilizing the present of ontology. But my question is, what do we do with the ghosts of animals that, I on, that die on screen? Do they haunt us? Or how do we conjure up their spirits when the scene of their death comes to an end? So as much as I acknowledge and understand the importance of activities towards ensuring the safety of real animal actors, I also want to think about how we relate to or empathize with the animals suffering on screen, even if they are not real in their materiality. So uh, I'm sure a number of you are aware of this already, but let me briefly summarize here. In, in recent years, we have seen a steady growth in scholarship on the relationship between animals and cinema. Uh, not so much in the context of Indian cinema yet or South Asian cinema yet, but European American cinema, in some cases, a couple of studies on Asian cinema. Uh, some uh, uh, book length uh, works have been done in the last seven, eight years or so, last decade. And of course, we have seen you know, publications of a number of journal articles on, on related uh, on things, aspects related to this concept. So a num there we can see two trends broadly in, these, uh, in this uh, body of scholarship. One is a number of them explored the role, of role and importance of animals in cinema theory. And uh, a lot of them are kind of returning or looking back to this wide body of film, film philosophy, film theory to find this a non-human turn or animal turn to borrow a phrase from the title of the webinar series uh, in those uh, uh, in those theoretical formulations and some are and another trend in, in this is of course studies on representation of animals in cinemas from different countries uh, for example, a kind of some of them take this historical overview, like a representation of animals in their different avatars in Hollywood cinema or, or things like that. So these are the two broad trends. Uh, the theoretical arc, of course, that determine the trajectory of these studies is to rethink cinema as a non-anthropocentric medium and to question some of the deep-rooted humanist underpinnings of cinema studies as a discipline. Uh, so I, I don't have the time here to give a more detailed survey of these studies. But uh, of course, uh, a number of these books are very, like have made some important mark in, in making us rethink, rethink cinema as a medium itself. Some of them have talked about uh, how animal, even in its material form, is essential for the beginning, uh, beginning of cinema's production, like the way films were made, the like all the all the all the 
objects, all the all the primary materials that were needed to create cinema as a medium, and and how animal body, different parts of animal bodies, their products and byproducts are uh, required were required for just manufacturing the medium. And of course, the other side also said that how particularly our relationship to to narrative cinema has remained uh, essentially humanist and anthropocentric where we are from that perspective we have been ignoring this curious presence and importance of uh, and non-human animals on screen uh, so a couple of them in recent times a uh, couple of these studies studying uh, like a couple of these books and works studying the overlaps of cinema and the non-human ecological world have rightly called for a quote, uh, quote, viral and virulent exploration of contacts between these two, that is the non-human non animal world and the cinematic world. And they say only a constant political and ecological attention to these contact zones can bring forth an epistemic shift, shift within the field a radically non-anthropocentric and non-humanist way of looking. Uh, for example, uh, uh, animal film studies scholars like Jennifer Fay and Anna Tpik uh, have looked back to Andre Bazin's writings on cinematic realism to argue that his idea of realism calls for a non-anthropocentric view of the real world. Uh, and I'm, I'll read a small quote, a short quote from, from Fay here, and Jennifer Fay writes, quote, realism as reimagined through animal, animals and nature is not merely the replication or record of the world as we humans perceive it, nor is it merely the space humans and animals share. Rather, this realism reveals the details of animate and inanimate life that are lost to the anthropocentric attention and history. So just to elaborate what Fay uh, proposes that uh, an, a kind of non-anthropocentric realism will make us pay attention to all those nooks and corners, crannies and forgotten alleyways where, where animate and inanimate, human and non-human, human and ecological life worlds collide with each other, entang are entangled with each other, or flow into each other's territory. And, and, and anthropocentric, only an anthropocentric attention to cinema and history comfortably ignore uh, and ignore when they think of realism. So what she is essentially asking for, calling for, is a kind of trans-species, uh, trans-ecological, non-humanist uh, imagination of realism uh, as an aesthetic strategy itself. The other person I mentioned, Anna Tpik, in her book, Creaturely Poetics, extends such reading of classic realist theory of cinema and proposes a thinking of what she calls creaturely cinema. The title of the book is Creaturely Poetics. Within that, like a part of that book, uh, uh, she writes about inhumanity in film. Uh, uh, and she comes up with the term creaturely cinema, where she says cinema, she looks at cinema as essentially a zoomorphic stage that transforms all animals, human and non-human, into creatures. And I'm, in my thinking, in, and for this talk, I'm particularly influenced by her theorization of creaturely poetics in cinema, by the way, by by the way she looks at cinematic representation of human and non-human precarity and vulnerability to propose creaturely cinema an ideal creaturely cinema manages to show an ontological destabilization across species line like she is thinking of a kind of ontologically leveling field where human that is that is cohabited by both human and non-human animals when in terms of their vulnerability and precarity on screen. Uh, but when it comes to animal death in cinema, the overwhelming tendency, and let me return, come back to my core interest here. Uh, animal death, when we think of, uh, or when it comes to animal death in cinema, the overwhelming tendency has been to remember and think about those that are considered important for the narrative. 
we consider important for, for, for the narrative. And as human spectator, we tend to pay attention to prominent animal figures on screen and I will uh, and, and their deaths on screen. I, I'll stay at home here and give example, cite examples from not so highbrow films at all and film texts that are most of us uh, familiar with. Bollywood, Hathi Mere Sathi, uh, Teri Meherbaniya, that classic dog death scene with Jackie Shroff, etc. And beyond India too, there are some very prominent uh, film texts, for example, from Iran, uh, one major film called uh, Gav or The Cow by Dariush Mirzui. Uh, Bresson's Balthazar and so this all these texts have very very uh, memorable animal deaths and we remember my point is we remember them we and we write about them we identify easily uh, identify animal deaths in these films because animals play prominent roles there so and while it is important to talk about and remember the dead animals in these films such a remembrance uh, my point is such a remembrance still remains deeply anthropocentric on one hand uh, not necessarily the examples i uh, or the entire film titles i mentioned here but there are many more uh, on one hand a number of these films practice what some scholars have termed as disneyfication of animals uh, kind of a disney world treatment of animals that is a humanist projection of cuteness uh, cute dogs, cute puppies, pandas, Dalmatians, and etc., etc. Or, or sometimes they are also they are also projections of abjectness. Oh, such a poor dog, such a poor cat. How how badly they are treated. So there is a kind of two di uh, like we treat them in this not as in terms of th their three dimensional presence, but the feelings that we have inside us, inside human animals, we kind of project those onto the, onto the, cine, the body of cinema or body and the being of the cinematic animal. Uh, and this is done sometimes uh, by, en like this is enhanced, this Disneyfication is sometimes enhanced by anthropomorphizing the animals. Like animals, we films show animals that almost behave behave almost like human beings they can play cricket or they uh, I, i'm thinking of some pop very very popular examples from bollywood uh, and, and and they do stuff almost like like circus animals uh, and <clears throat> so essentially instead of looking at and thinking about the animals in terms of their pure animalness these disneyfied animals Sim uh, or Disneyfication simply deploy animals to ventriloquies on behalf of their human counterparts, using the animal species determined otherness and simply making them empty placeholders for human emotions, perspectives, and often ideologies. Most of this, uh, and most of these films, film texts fail to make cinema non anthropocentric and render, in my view, the animal presence almost pointless, that they do not remain animal in, in their animalness. They can easily be replaced by some human counterparts. And I must mention here that I do not want to underestimate the importance of paying, uh, like paying attention to the politics and poetics of this kind of companionship that we see in a lot of these films. I, for example, like I think uh, Hathi Mere Sathi's portrayal of human animal relationship is extremely fascinating when it is considered like in terms of its correlation with the heterosexual conjugal space in the film but that is a point of another discussion i'll stay away from that for now so yes those companion representations or depictions of those companionships need to be looked at but what about others uh, and Again, no, uh, as I mentioned, that sometimes it's not only the Disneyfication involves not only cuteness, but they are often they are also associated with extreme wilderness, projecting such a space essentially othered from the human inhabited worlds. So it's not always cute animals, but sometimes extremely wild animals as as a source of danger, threat, 
and i'm thinking of all these films where you would see that these explorers and and human who have gone kind of astray who have lost their paths and they enter into these danger zones forests and 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 they are often they are sometimes attacked by these uh, violent uh, violent animals and the whole the horror of this film these films is generated by this ex- uh, instinct for human survival like for 2 hours the plot revolves around that how a one in, uh, one or a group of indiv- human beings survive against this wilderness so again a, a sense of, of otherness is created where animal is put in its uh, in their natural habitat natural wild habitat which is essentially unknown to the human uh, explorer or hunter almost like an accidental entrance staging an accidental entrance of the human body into these zones uh another set is uh, also there that uh, a number of these prominent narrative films also use animals as metaphors particularly vulnerable precarious dying animals as metaphors for their human counterparts so instead of inviting the spectator to enter and inhabit the world and dwelling of the non-human animals they use them for their metaphoricity for their metaphoric value so the animal non-human animal suffering and death is used to work as a metaphorical replacement sometimes as a precursor or a premonitory element for human suffering uh like where uh, an animal is dying on screen and this is not only in cinema but also uh also it happens in literary text quite regularly particularly when showing uh, uh talking about uh vulnerability of uh, minority communities or socially marginalized communities uh, otherwise depressed communities that their abjection their suffering is metaphorically shown through the abjection of non human animals so my point is all these three types engage in marking as ultimately marking a species determined temporality for non human animals they are even if even in the depiction sometimes graphic depiction of of their suffering they are absolute they they take these two approach either they are absolutely contemporaneous with our that is our human existence that is they do the way we expect them to do or they do they perform the way we perform or the other sense is their way of being in the world is absolutely anachronistic from our human perspective i'm talking here the the wilderness the violent grizzly bears and they, that is there that they live in a different temporal zone and and here the question of space and time are of course closely uh, connected and so these are the things that either their their temporality is temporal existence can be entirely mapped on to our temporal understanding our temporal location or it is absolutely other and that is what i think what stops us from looking at animals and their suffering from a non anthropocentric position because we don't leave our own temporal position while looking at these things uh so so the as i mentioned so sometimes we see depiction of animal death in this films with graphic and minute details so much so that they force us to respond to them with extreme emotions fill us with sadness anger disgust but still i would say that this is this does not break the humanist way of or anthropocentric way of looking at them uh so what we are seeing here a uh, uh, kind of two emergence of two ends to return to aha and all this human uh, animal rights activism and uh, like they, they, their end is this material material political like okay as long as it is a living animal outside of the screen we will ensure their safety on the other side we are seeing emergence of a metaphorical political where okay we can in, relate to their suffering as long as we take them as metaphors but that's it my my question is is there something in between or what lies beyond these two these two possibilities 
and this actually makes me think about the lives and deaths of not so remarkable animals in cinema and this is i i think in order to come up with with a with a non anthropocentric way of thinking and remembering uh suffering and death of animals on screen we need to be uh, alerted we need to be attentive to uh, to appearance of animals who are not so remarkable who suffer deaths and violations but which is difficult to be seen as replacement for human life they are not simply simply pay, uh, simple placeholders for our own existence they are not metaphors sometimes these unremarkable animals do play their part in creating or sustaining or adding to the narrative and the cinematic diegetic space but uh, they often appears as characters with no memorable screen presence or dialogues but they are to use a term from like the human production uh, world appear as extras or background artists and here i would like to propose a thinking that is not determined by the dimensions of suffering animal body that is thinking beyond the three dimensional real or one dimensional metaphorical animals it does not matter if the real animals are treated with utmost care and love during the making of the film and their on screen counterparts are not subjected to actual death uh also it does not matter if their life and death make a palpable impact on the humanist perception of the narrative or the image and couple of examples i would like to point out uh, uh, one of the uh, if i can again share my screen here and i will i would like to return to a, a film or set of films that are all too familiar uh, to us that is ray's opu trilogy uh recently i was teaching and talking about this film and watch revisit the trilogy after quite some time and lot has been written on on these films uh but uh, uh it but i noticed certain things that i had missed perhaps i was looking at this films from uh, again a humanist position an anthropocentric position which as as a personal as as me, myself as an individual spectator but as i am trying to break my own practice my own familiar break out of my own familiar zone i started noticing this thing and this is a curious thing i'm sure a lot of you who are here you must have seen all these three uh, three films three pother uh, panchali oporajito and and opur shongshar and uh, and i don't have to tell you that the the entire trilogy is replete with deaths uh replete there are way too many deaths that that happen in in the male protagonist life and if i ask you to do a body count uh, uh I, 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 sorry there is no possibility of an introduction here live interaction here but i would like to i am extremely curious to know or get an answer from those who actually watched the ent- all the three films that how many how many deaths are there uh, and i i did that i asked that question to myself that how many deaths are there and my first response first remembrance were were five uh five deaths uh, and i asked other people the same uh, thing there are five deaths and the five deaths being there are two deaths in the first part mm, that is uh, the death of this old aunt uh and the first part ends with the with the death of the elder sister second part uh, there are two deaths again in the beginning the father dies and the film ends with um, with the death of the mother uh right and the third part of course very memorable death is the death of the uh the wife um and these are five deaths but as i returned to to the film i saw there are a couple of other deaths uh that 
we don't often pay attention to we don't remember uh, by the way in the in the novel the original text there are way too many there are many more deaths and at least if not uh, like allusions uh, so let, let me show you one interesting clip from just a second uh from the first part to kind of as as an example of what i am thinking of this deaths of unremarkable uh, not so remarkable animals on screen Just give it a, give me a moment. It's like the video seems to be buffering at my end. Uh, I hope it is visible. So this is. As you can see, this is almost like towards the end of the film. The elder sister has fallen sick after uh, getting drenched in torrential rain. We are waiting, like we can now anticipate her death. It's monsoon season. And just. Watch the clip and then I can So uh, I wanted to pause here and as you can in see uh, there is a dead body here there is a dead body on on screen uh, a frog um, uh, and uh, of course no one keeps record of had it been a human 
had it been a human actor dead human actor perhaps we would have had some kind of production history some kind of anecdotes and things like that but no one keeps record of this 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 frog uh, dead frog I, and I, of course i i don't know if it is staged if it is how many frogs were actually killed to do this 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 uh, this scene uh, there is no archive of this of this frog yet it enters the cinematic space it enters the diegetic space uh, um, and and my point is this and 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 if you remove it the narrative doesn't change uh, the human story doesn't change at all uh, it is it is perhaps there uh, or filmmaker decided to put it there to create a sense of naturalism uh, create a, a sense of give it give uh, give authenticity to this natural and very realist Uh, representation of this trans species devastation but even some very observant human spectator won't probably remember the frog uh which i at least i i did not um, and there are in fact and i see if you are interested i sincerely ask you to revisit the film just from the the trilogy from the animal perspective we forget all the human characters that appear on screen just pay attention to the animals not all necessarily always dead animals or suffering animals but animals there are um, and uh, like this was briefly some some of this scenes are briefly mentioned by an essay by a film scholar called moina vishash uh, like pigs pigs appear in in the second part when uh, second or third part uh and even even in the third part in opur shongsha there are two more deaths that again we don't remember we don't pay attention to one is after opu gets the news of his wife's death he is there is a scene where he is probably contemplating committing suicide by jumping in front of a train and just before he is standing there is a scene he is standing next to a train speeding by maybe he is about to jump and he hears a shriek an animal shriek that is and the shriek comes from uh, a pig being hit by a by a train and that kind of jolts him out of his days and he comes back he does not uh, go ahead with his plan and again that 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 death is forgotten and uh, there is one more death in the in the film that is uh, when when we see opu's young son and he kills uh, a bird uh, he kills a bird and kind of he uses the dead body of that bird to scare uh, a maid servant and steal a piece of fish or something so what my point is that uh, we need to think of need to get out of this idea of importance in order to think of an essential or radical animal turn in cinema studies that uh, we need to stop thinking or stop remembering animals just because from our th- perspective they are uh, they are important for for our story uh, i would like to end kind of uh by saying that these animals these un, not so remarkable animals are actually they mark an excess through their inconsequential presence and their casual erasure from the spectators that is human spectators memory and uh, one major film like film and cultural studies scholar called akira lipit in her, in his book called electric animal uh presents a uh, uh kind of presents a critique a post structuralist critique of western metaphysics and he says that animals die and i'm giving a quote here quote, um, i'm quoting a phrase from his work and he says animals die but they are incapable of death it's a very paradoxical uh, state statement that they die but they are incapable of death what he means that uh they are incapable of death because their temporality do not matter that does not matter in 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 
in anthropocentric metaphysics. Their, their death, deaths are not remembered. So they can biologically die, but they are incapable, their deaths are not events within that. While I agree with, uh, with Lipit's uh, critique of Western metaphysics, uh, the very deep-rooted anthropocentric uh, centrism that is there, but at the same time, I think we need to get out of this 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 uh, this mode of remembering, and we need to acknowledge instead of just making animals die, we need to acknowledge their deaths, even if the most unremarkable un for, or unremarkable or forgettable ones, to do justice or to approach uh, to to create an ethical approach to the deaths and after lives of cinematic animals uh, with that i think i will stop here and would like to uh, get uh, comments and questions i uh, nishant i hope i did not go like over time or no 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 not a problem okay. there was some there was some delay and then some interruptions but yeah it went on really well so thank you shivdeep thanks a lot for that wonderful talk and now we would take the questions we already have some questions uh, shivdeep uh, can you see the questions on the question and answer window I can see the chat. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but there are... I, I, I haven't been following the chat. Now I can see the chat, but uh, if you can point me towards the actual, because there are a lot of other kind of comments. Yeah. But I uh, would read out the questions which have come in the question and answer window. Okay. So first oh, okay. one... There is a Q and a window. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. yes. I, can I... you open it? Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm not too... I'm familiar with regular zoom presentations but not too familiar with the webinar okay. format okay okay but now i can see yes hmm. uh, so the first one is uh, i recall reading that the horse in the film jesse james was so freaked out after the jump into the water that it thrashed about in the water yes you are uh, that is what uh, what I also read. Uh, there are lots of kind of contradictory uh, recording about some, as I was mentioning, that people involving with the uh, involved in the production. They said that they gave absolute like uh, they tried to ensure safety as much as they could, and give gave some details that okay, we used a, a wide platform and it was a soft landing for the uh, for for the horse and etc but yes uh, some people say that it was it's i the, the horse died out of shock because it was it totally freaked out uh, christina d uh, uh, this, this reminds me of the lawsuit after cannibal holocaust was screened as the director was accused of distributing a snuff film and had to bring in actors to prove they had not died in production the same concern, however, wasn't extended to the real living animals killed. How do we grapple with the issue of recognition of animals themselves as individuals and not interchangeable elements of a series of species? Yes, of course, as I was, uh, I did not get into that uh, side, as, but I hinted at when I was talking about, uh, about uh, uh, Jesse James, that uh, the male actors, um, both Powers and, and Fonda were given body double, but uh, uh, the the horse was not. And and of course, how could how could it be uh, given? Uh, and this is this is this uh, very humanist way of of approaching animal and and animals, no matter uh, what species they are from, that they are mutually replaceable so the point is that our approach is is very binaristic on one side is to answer this question a bit more elaborate in, uh, in a more uh, more elaborate way that uh, one thing is we one side on one side we treat them mutually as mutually interchangeable a horse is a horse is a horse or a dog is a dog is a dog 
and at the on the other side of the spectrum is we give them individual identity as long as they become our beloved companions so their individuality is premised upon our establishment of the uh, relationship with them so the the idea is how to get out of these two extremities how do we recognize their individuality even if there is no 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 relationship of companionship between that is that is the uh, that is the conundrum here uh, but yes um, i think it is a constant process uh, both philosophically and materially that how to grapple with the uh, with the issue of recognition as uh, uh, of animals non human animals as individuals uh some and that is why i think that you know the deaths and lives of cinematic animals are easily remembered as long as they are prominent they are they have proper names in some cases but these nameless animals are are because they are often received as mutually interchangeable they are forgotten uh that uh, that is the point i was trying to make uh the next question So Nishan, do you want me to continue reading this uh, questions, or I cannot hear you? Yeah. Cannot... Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So I would read out the questions to you because I didn't want to dis- interrupt you right now because you were answering the previous question. So mm-hmm. I would just read out the question. Uh, so the next question is actually this uh, remark is now actually a question. There is a question by Salman Abbas. Mm-hmm. what do you think about the mystic engagement of the animals where they are only put into mystic spaces as beings of magical realms and centuries of the supernatural dimensions what do you think of the love craftian sea monsters where the fish like appearance is the sole reason for their otherworldliness uh i have a kind of two pronged approach to this of course uh, as the question itself uh, there is there is a kind of i can see uh, an uh, assumed answer in the question itself uh, that uh, yes by rendering them magical they are rendering them otherworldly uh, we are essentially putting them into another universe another another zone that is different separated from the one that we from the one we inhabit um by turning them mystical by turning them magical uh, but at the same time uh, this answer also like this thing that just because they are magical they are other worldly we are also assuming a world for ourselves as if we live in a non magical world as if we live in an absolutely demystified world uh and there has been there are some scholarship going uh, uh, appear, uh, appearing uh, where where people are paying attention to not only literary text and very interesting work uh, work is being done by a number of anthropologists where they are looking at life worlds both cultural literary or non literary lived lived world where there is an overlap of 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 human and and magical there is a kind of more organic coexistence of the mystical and what we consider human where there there is no essential essential separation uh, and i think both this like when we deal with this this concept um, when we deal with these kind of uh, cultural texts we need to see remain attentive whether we are considering ma- their magicality or their magical presence as something essentially other to ourselves or are we thinking or are they provoking us to think of another way of inhabiting the world inhabiting the planet if i say uh, i should use the word planet where uh, yes uh, the magical or quote unquote magical and the real they are overlapping with each other they are they are ontologically one with each other if that answer your question but yes um, 
what I'm trying to say that there is, I can see an assumed answer in that question, which I don't necessarily agree with. Yeah. Thanks, Shubhadeep. Now we have two, three questions. So I'll be very quick with the next question. So this question is from Belinda Kleinhans. And she says, thanks, very interesting. I wonder whether you are familiar with and could comment on contemporary Austrian filmmaker, Michael Haneke, and his insistence to kill animals in bracket, even today, live on screen. And then there is a statement in the bracket that is the animals are harmed for the making of his films. And there is nearly no film that doesn't do that. Where would you place him and his use of animal suffering? Um, I, I have to say it has, I, I used to be very, and I still am perhaps, uh, uh, very fond of Hanukkah's film. Uh, uh, and it has been quite some time since I watched because uh, sometimes the violence became too much for me. That is that is not from any theoretical perspective, just just too too brutal for me. Just and so I'm afraid. Like uh, yes, uh, I can say I can say like un try to answer this question not perhaps specifically in terms of. Hanukkah's films or those texts because I need to revisit them. But in general, I can answer, try to answer this question that why, what if we encounter a filmmaker who insists on kill, killing real animals for the purpose of making this film? And that is, that is, the, that is I think, the, the uh, curious part I, I hope I was trying, uh, I, uh, I was trying to address that uh, the ethical relationship or, or non-anthropocentric ethics that we are think, trying to think, does it simply end or does it simply, uh, or do we reach that uh, horizon by just ensuring not to kill real animals that as, as AHA does, Animal uh, American Human Association does that, okay, we are fine. As long as real animals are not killed or harmed or violated, etc., I don't care if, if they. So this is where, like, I'm not, of course, not um, advocating for advocating for. Okay, kill the real animal. Doesn't matter. Those material lives, those lived lives, do matter. But my point is, our approach to their deaths and lives should not end by saying that, okay, as long as the real animals are not killed, uh, I'm fine with that. But I'm afraid, uh, the, like, I need to revisit Hanukkah's film to make a more informed comment uh, on his politics. Um, there I, like, just to go a bit off topic here, I'm appearing as, an, as the odd animal out that I mentioned in the beginning, the non-German studies person. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Shuvadeep. Uh, so there are two more questions and uh, we have like 10 minutes left hardly to finish the session. So the next question is from Prashant Kumar Pandey. He asks, in a German literary work which deals with Holocaust, two Nazi soldiers kill a Jew and then start discussion about humanity. Are the human beings somehow comparable with those Nazis in context of animals? Uh, let me read the question. Are the human beings somehow comparable with those Nazis in the con? Uh, like, I'm not sure which anim human beings is the uh, like is is he referring to? Like in last last part, the actual question: Are the human beings somehow compare human beings? I mean, does he mean generally human beings or? Or, um, like, I'm afraid the question I, itself yeah. is not very clear to yeah. me. I think he's referring to with those Nazis, he's saying he's comparing, uh, he's referring to two Nazi soldiers in the previous sentence. So I assume that is his reference point. So uh, let me read the question again. In a German literary work which deals with Holocaust, uh, two Nazi soldiers kill a Jew and then start discussion about humanity. Are the human beings somehow comparable with those Nazis in context of animals? Uh, again, the question does not seem clear to me, but uh, uh, 
if i can like i'm just trying to figure out the question and uh, like this is this is not and and this is where i think and not perhaps in the context of this talk but larger discussion in in animal studies or critical animal studies has been going on that uh, this this animal as the other or animal as the beneath something beneath is does not remain limited uh, in a binaristic way between humans and animals we see and this is there has been a parallel history of of uh, 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 during the last 2 300 years in fact uh, a kind of how human human species itself created gradations within itself gradations within itself by through racism through antisemitism through anti minority discourses etc etc that okay everybody just because we are physiologically same we do not attain the status of the same same human so so this animalization of or animalization as a mode of inferiorization pervades uh, like uh travels across species line what i'm point trying to say that humans have done that to non human animals as well as to other quote unquote inferior humans within the same species boundary for example like anybody can you can like some of you or may already know this that look at the history of racism like anti, anti black racism and you will see almost a contemporaneous uh, emergence of these two discourses a species determined classification of beings and racism uh, 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 like not only anti black basically anti non white racism uh, in in western western philosophy and this is this, if that answers you answers your question that there is and you will find a lot of texts uh, at some of them like I, i am familiar with this absolute animalization and animalization i don't want to keep it as a as as a constant mode of inferiorization it can be it may not be so in this case yes there are animalization and inferiorization of jewish bodies in 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 nazi germany uh, where as i said that those deaths and to connect to the, the topic of 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 my talk here as if their deaths are not remember worthy of remembering archiving recording these are not so remarkable death yes yeah uh, shubhadeep we yes. have uh, two more questions oh, we have more questions coming in but unfortunately we are running short of time so one question which we have is from an the anonymous attendee of this webinar so the question is how would the shooting of the elephant be treated in orwell's short story shooting an elephant yeah and mm. uh, you know colonial depiction this is a very well known story shooting uh, shooting an elephant and and this is again uh, uh, like if we go to like how colonial literature uh, presented or or portrayed uh, treatment of animal uh, of course i i should not say that they did it single in a singular way uh, but here uh, in that particular story orwell actually uses the elephant or or abjectness of the elephant or helplessness of the elephant in that story in order to kind of uh, ratify legitimize legitimize the civilizing mission of the, of the colonial machinery that and you will see it's 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 kind of continuity even in 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 post colonial literatures even in indian south asian context that oh these people are so barbaric these people are so uncivilized heartless cruel that they do this thing to this helpless helpless animal so it is the job of of uh job of mm, the colonial administrator and and of course in post colonial context some rational educated 
human being to spread the message of 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 animal rights so it can work both ways on the one hand you will see that that use of animals or animal infested areas in colonial literature kind of um, created colonized spaces as imagined wild spaces of wilderness that everything is backward every, there are animals and and we need to like humanize this space but on the other hand sometimes this helpless uh, presentation representation of helpless violated animals are also uh, a mode of legitimizing colonial presence that we need to make this barbaric colonized people into more human beings if that answer your question Okay, Shivadeep, uh, we have uh, one question from the YouTube where this live streaming is going on. So this question is from Rinu Krishna, which philosopher stated, in quotes, "Animals die, but they are incapable of death." Oh, okay, yeah, that that was a quote. I was uh, it, uh, like, uh, this is this is this is a quote from a book called Electric Animal, written by Akira Lippet. he is a he is a professor of cinema and cultural studies and in university of southern california here okay yeah and now we have the last question that is from chandrika kumar why do we not talk about life forms instead of animals uh i am afraid i don't understand the question uh i think i have been talking about life forms of animals but also after life forms of animals after they are dead uh so uh one of the things that i was trying to make that we need to pay attention like even if uh, just to repeat myself even if they are not these animal life forms are they are not directly impactful on our life forms we need to recognize and remember their casual presence their strainness uh in order to do justice to their death okay i guess with that we can conclude our webinar thanks a lot for all the participants for attending today's webinar and i hope it was interesting as well as productive for you and uh, thank you shivdeep also for you know taking out time to share your ideas with us and also for this wonderful webinar talk thank yes. you very much uh, thank you again Nish nishan yes and anu, anu is not here but i cannot see anu but... is here with me oh okay Uh, all so, my colleagues are here thank you you can you can see us yes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we three have been doing this webinar now. i i hope the talk was not a total waste of time but uh, no no it was wonderful <laughs> great <laughs> it was uh, we have got nice. some glowing reviews about the talk so okay. share anu will share it with you later okay thank you i'll thanks for inviting thanks a lot shivdeep thanks thank a lot you. bye bye